In the name of Jesus, Amen. The word of God for the message this morning is the gospel lesson in the 10th chapter of Luke. And to get the sermon started, I might say, knock, knock. No, no, <laughs> no I had enough of that for today. I love this story of Mary and Martha. My notes say that I love M&M, but I love that candy too. But it is Mary and Martha. It's a story so plain, so simple, and yet so meaningful for all of us. And the scene of the action is the humble little town of Bethany. As in, O oh, little town of Beth, no, that's the wrong town. That would be Bethlehem. The word Bethany means literally the home of the poor or the afflicted, and with good reason, as I will show you. The history of Bethany goes all the way back to the days of the Canaanites, long before the Israelites even conquered the Promised Land for themselves. There were Canaanites there, and uh, they had a tomb there, which might become significant for us. A one that was according to Canaanite style. So if any of you know what the Canaanite style is, I'd like to know myself. But and anyway, it was right on the Mount of Olives, that part you know. It was close enough to the city of Jerusalem, just across the Kidron Valley. It was that close that, um, uh, they, that Bethany was considered to be a, a suburb of Jerusalem. And that's significant because true worshipers in the Passover actually had to physically stay in Jerusalem for the entirety of the Passover celebration. And, uh, and so, since Bethany was a suburb, you could stay in Bethany for the Passover because that was part of Jerusalem, within Jerusalem's city limits, as it were. Now, Jesus would never miss a Passover. Think about it a minute. The Passover is ultimately about him, is it not? <laughs> being the Passover for our sins. And, and uh, being at all these Passovers, you can bet that Jesus spent many a time, maybe a dozen or more times, at Bethany and two of their chief residents, Mary and Martha. They were best of friends with Jesus. Mary and Martha, and the third we don't often remember, but he was a brother of Mary and the brother of Martha, and that's Lazarus. That guy, that guy that uh, died and was put in a tomb there, but only as a temporary quarters. The Bible and says that there is also one other resident of Bethany that's listed in another place, and that is Simon the leper. Now bear with me for just a second about Simon the le leper. Martha was often at the house of Simon the leper who was very, very sick, and she would minister to him uh, constantly. It was like Martha belonged, belonged with him and this is a gave her a rise to a tradition that Mar Martha was actually the, the wife of Simon and thus eventually the widow of uh, Simon. And tradition says that she stayed right there in Bethany and she kept the house of her husband and to make a go of things she had what would you would call sort of a, a bed and breakfast kind of a, arrangement where um, 
that's how she would get to be preparing all this food anyway, right? And, uh, but that would be her business to start up sort of a, as an inn, like something that a good Samaritan would use to take care of someone who had been beaten and left for dead on the road. But oh, there's so much in Mary and Martha. I love this kind of stuff. Jesus tells a story of a man who was, was uh, beaten and uh, attacked and robbed within an inch of his life, but then he was helped by the Good Samaritan. And the Good Samaritan was, uh, all this happened on the road to, Jer to Jericho. And Bethany was actually on the road to Jericho. So everybody would see what a fitting example this was. But it, it's all sort of crunched, crunched together in uh, the Promised Land. Because uh, within a half a mile of Bethany, there's the Garden of Gethsemane, the place where Jesus ascended into heaven. A little bit further off to the west is Golgotha and the site of the cross. It's all right there. And, oh, oh, and there's one last thing. Bethany was also the home of Ishmael. Not the Ishmael that's in the Bible, but Ishmael, the bus driver, because he drove... <laughs> yeah, he was a fast driver. <laughs> He really was. And Ishmael was the driver of the tour bus, and he happened to live in Bethany. And as he was driving along, I said, where are you going? We're going to my home. And believe it or not, he stopped in Bethany to pick up his lunch. He had forgotten his lunch. And at that time, I had a chance to meet his wife and his three kids, all residents of Bethany. It was a magic moment. You had to be there to see it. Anyway, you can still hear echoing around Bethany. I'm sure I could hear it. You'd hear, Lazarus, come forth, which is what Jesus said over uh, Lazarus' grave. And he recovered quickly. And he recovered just in time for Palm Sunday. And the Bible says the reason why the Palm Sunday crowd welcoming Jesus was so big, the people wanted to see not just him, but they wanted to see Lazarus too. Because how often do you get to see someone walking around who used to be dead? So that was the box office attraction. And uh, you know, it's funny what happened from this. The Jews always hated Jesus himself, that was par for the course. But they also hated Lazarus. They hated Lazarus enough that they wanted to kill him too. Or should I say, kill him <coughs> again. Ah, oh, he's been through death once. He wouldn't mind being dead one more time. But the Jews wanted to kill Lazarus and Jesus because Lazarus was evidence. He was evidence of Jesus' power and uh, his uh, mercy. And so he could literally die with the Lord Jesus. Mary and Martha, what a simple story. Jesus, it's really a simple story. He's at the house of his friends He's talking for quite a while with Mary, and we have a general subject matter. And there are no miracles performed, just the food that Martha prepared, and prepared no more food than that, no miraculous feeding of 5,000 or something like that. And then, featured in the story, was Martha complaining about her sister because she wasn't helping with the meal. And that's it, that's a simple story, and. Uh, well, that's not exactly it. Remember, 
Lazarus was at home. And according to the timetable here, Lazarus was eating with them now, but he would soon be dead. Temporarily. But uh, the Mary and Martha did not have to complain because they would see soon see Lazarus in heaven itself. So there's a Lazarus thing, and of course, what makes it special is Jesus is there. And what is Jesus doing? He's teaching Mary about his love, his care, his forgiveness, his mercy, his faithfulness to his promises, and his blessed and glorious destination in heaven. Yes, he was teaching Mary the gospel centered in the cross and in Jesus' resurrection. And he was telling them, telling her about God's power and his own grace, of course. And as a personal note, he could say to Mary, don't you worry about Lazarus. He's going to be perfectly okay. All this and the story exclaims, and this is how Luke puts it, all this stuff is literally God's dish, God's portion, God's casserole. It's a word that's used for food. Ah, Mary has the great recipe, listening to the gospel, and he says, Mary has the one thing needful, the one thing that we cannot live without. The moral of the story for us in our day and age is uh, we're going to continue with the food imagery for a moment. The message for this story is for us to cut the baloney. Now I love baloney. No, either, but sometimes you have to cut the baloney because people think of life in very shallow terms. Life is making money, making a living, and making more money. And life is uh, working, maybe learning some more skills, and then working some more. And uh, setting up perhaps some goals for yourself, maybe strategizing in your life, perhaps getting preoccupied with cooking. Now that's something for me, not really. Or how about how can we enhance our entertainment or enhance our transportation so we can get a vehicle that's as big as a school bus when we could get along with the Volkswagen. And life, it means going to the doctors. And life is about worrying about going to the doctors. But by itself, and I emphasize by itself, all this stuff is baloney. So cut the baloney. The heart of the matter is sitting at Jesus' feet, hearing the gospel. Yes, the gospel. Hearing about your salvation through Jesus and his grace. Being strengthened by Jesus for everyday life. And finally being carried to be with Jesus. Life is all about hearing the gospel. Life is about tasting the gospel in the Lord's Supper. That's all stuff that happens in the church, is it not? Uh, it's about... Life is all about looking forward to heaven itself. So that uh, when all is said and done, and you're on your deathbed, you can say, I trusted in Jesus, I fought the good fight, and you know life used to be so complicated, but with Jesus, it's all so simple because of uh, his mercy. 
hearing and knowing the gospel. That's the recipe. That's the one thing needful. And knowing that, you're not going to let the baloney crowd the valuable stuff out of your life. Just a couple of examples and I'm done about cutting the baloney. How about your spouse? Am I going to try to make it husband toward wife or wife toward husband? Are you offering your spouse financial security? Are you uh, perhaps entertaining with your spouse the thought of getting just a little bit bigger house? Are you perhaps thinking of a, about a retirement plan and how you want to set up for that? Or are you talking with each other excitedly about your permanent home in heaven? There's one thing in there that's not baloney, is it not? And how about the kids? I find it strange sometimes with how, how parents honor or treat their kids. How about the kids, you'll say? I want to make sure that he's in the National Honor Society, and I want to make sure that he's popular with the rest of the students and wouldn't want his feelings hurt. And I hope he can uh, make the uh, football team and I hope he makes the swimming team, and I hope he can perhaps make the debate team, and that uh, uh, he can be part of the homecoming court. Wouldn't that be wonderful for my boy? Are you concerned about all these things, or are you making sure that he gets into his adult life with Jesus? Are you making sure he's keeping in touch with Jesus when you are too old to do so anymore? Are you making sure your child stays with Jesus? Now, are you making sure to the point of desperation on your part? Have you been giving him all along the one thing needful and uh, because we're not talking about just one menu item among a whole list of treats. It's about Jesus and what life is all about. One more simple thing. Cutting the bologna like Mary did. How about choosing a pastor? Does he have to be as good looking as I am? <laughs> Don't say better. Does he tell better jokes than I or Bubba? Uh, or is your number one concern about a new pastor that he knows the gospel? and that he's urgent about it. And he wants, uh, I want him to convince me and my children that that's the best portion. We want a pastor who gives us the best portion, the best recipe, the best dish, the best casserole. And I can tell you one thing, whatever, whoever we get for a pastor, he'll leave the casseroles to you and he'll worry about the main course. That's what you want, isn't it? Amen.